Without further ado, I'd like to call upon now the speaker and representative from the city of Trani, the Health and Development MMC, Yolanda Mabusela. Councillor, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Program Director, Nelson Mandela Center of Memory, Professor Ndebele, the Chair of Nelson Mandela Center of Memory, Mrs. Krasha Michelle, Mrs. Zanele Mbegi, our Honorable Guests, Mo Ibrahim, Mr. Silo Hatang, the CEO of Nelson Mandela, Center of Memory, the Freedom Park CEO, Fana Gianni, our distinguished guests. A very good morning to all of you. We bring you warm greetings from the citizens of the city of Swane, and we welcome you all in your prominence to the Women in Dialogue session. This session is one in a series of initiatives designated for critical reflections on the formidable challenges facing our nation's democracy. All of this we do in the contents of the month-long program dedicated in honoring the memory of Nelson Rolichata Mandela. The, ontolo the ontological, epistemological vocation of today's session is to explore the dy dynamics driving the extent and nature of social cohesion in the society. We are thus endlessly grateful to the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory for creating such a crucial platform to enable an ongoing discourse of what is clearly an important dynamic of our time. A working definition of social cohesion is provided by, by President Jacob Zuma in his address to the National Summit on Social Cohesion in 2012 in which he defines social cohesion as the extent to which a social society is coherent, united, and functional, providing an environment within which its citizens can flourish. In other words, new sources and perspectival variation with notwithstanding at the heart of the notion of social cohesion are issues that bind society together and prevent its unity and integrity. As an analytic tool, it draws critical attention to issues that are central to cementing social bonds such as social inclusion, social capital, and social mobility. Viewed in this way, appreciation about social cohesion argument to societal existence as constantly evolving reality. Ladies and gentlemen, we can thus far state without fear of contradiction that the history of human society is a history of innocent struggle to establish, re-establish and maintain social cohesion in the light of abjurate, countervailing forces of nature. From the Industrial Revolution to the present, societies have always been seized with attempts to reinforce that bring about dislocation and disruption to orderly functioning of the society. Dislocation and discontinuities are thus not unique in our era. What sets apart each period from preceding ones in how such developments are understood and responses to their effect conceptualized and implemented. As Albert Einstein cautioned, I quote, we cannot solve problems by using the same thinking frameworks that created them in the first instance." Close quote. As we examine the sources, nature, and extent of present-day dislocation, we need to keep a disponentiate and yet engage distance to help us take nothing for granted, so that everything can be equally subjected to the same judgment, seat of reason. Just yesterday, we were reminded on, of how South Africa has evolved to become the most unequal society in the world of today, and how some of our policy choices are heavily implemented in the evolution of this reality. The moral of this story is that not only did we fail to reduce level of poverty and inequality, 
we have most importantly either through cause acts of omission or omission, deepen poverty and inequality. We therefore need sufficiently implicate our macroeconomic policy environment to examine the extent to which its account for the societal problem unfolding before our own eyes. We need to subject dominant orthodoxies for crucial scrutiny and ask why is it that in spite of prophecy of the tackle down effect, millions of people trickle down into the ranks of poverty alongside pocket of influence. We need to look at why is it that technocratically sound policy frameworks often result in deficient distributional mechanisms that serve the widened and social schisms in society. We need to ask what explains the reality that the majority of our people seem habituated to precarious forms of existence and thus resign themselves to despair and hopelessness. We need to explore what needs to be urgently done to rediscover our common purpose in life and pursue uniform interests guided by similar objectives and standards. Ladies and gentlemen, it is in the contents of this question and the range of others that we look towards a stimulating and enriching insights from the eminently placed panel to guide our deliberations. We are highly honored and distinctly privileged to have persons of your caliber to lead our efforts to cognate on what is clearly an explosive developmental of the 21 sexual. Distinguished guests, let us all join in collective process of contemplating and substantive and formal issue central to the success of our democratic experience. You are welcome to the present and affordable shores of the metropolitan city of Swane. When coming to debates, there are no holy cows in the city of Swan. And accordingly, please desist from self-restraint and self-censorship. Let us severely and join push the frontiers and limits and subject matters to reveal its concealed illumination summit. Let us all sharpen our powers and persuasions to scale new heights in our understanding of issues and social cohesion beyond textbook precepts. Welcome and thank you for joining us in the city. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, uh, Councillor Ma Buzela. So as we've heard, the aim then is through the process of social cohesion to build an empowered, fair and inclusive citizenry and establish one national identity. The four pillars, as we know, in this journey are diversity, inclusivity, values and access. But the question, though, is how? How do we build social cohesion? To help us answer that a little bit is the chairperson of the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory and towering public intellect intellectual, Professor Njabula Debele. A warm welcome to him. Thank you very much, Ngiwe. Uh, and uh, it is my pleasure to welcome the MMC Mabusela, who is representing the, the executive mayor of uh, Tswane and other MMCs present. A delight to welcome uh, Mrs. Michelle and uh, Mrs. Simbegi, and also our panelists. Uh, welcome Dr. Ibrahim and Ms. Hafaji, and Ms. Bulambo, and Ms. Mohammed. And to you all, honorable guests, I feel, on behalf of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, privileged to welcome you to this event today to, so that together we can address one of the most pressing challenges that face our country today the whole issue of, of equality. To help us do that, it's a privilege to be in the presence of 
distinguished uh, women, extraordinary women, who are present with us today, not only today, but are always in our minds in the public domain beyond the month of August. And that is the measure of their impact. Today's event speaks to the heart of the work of the Nelson Mandela Foundation through the Center of Memory, where we endeavor to, to deliver an integrated and dynamic and trusted resource on the legacy of Nelson Mandela. And our mandate is to promote that vision and the work of our founder by convening dialogues and creating platforms of engagement around critical issues to promote social justice and drive positive change. Our country, South Africa, continues on, to occupy a unique space in Africa and, and globally as an example of one country and its people who emerged from the intersections of deeply rooted racial, cultural, and political divides. It was through the timely and robust dialogue that we were able to transform contestants into stakeholders. And dialogue was fundamental to achieving that in the legacy of Madiba uh, to South Africa's transition from apartheid to, to democracy. He based his entire life on the principle of dialogue and the art of listening and speaking to others. It is also the art of getting others to listen and speak to each other. His legacy has created the opportunity for our nation and many other people across the world to achieve a common future. The dialogue this morning will no doubt provide a rich opportunity for all of us as key stakeholders in the building of peace and democracy to engage on what is an extremely relevant and important issue currently, that is the role of gender equality in, building, in the building of social cohesion. South Africa's transition not only brought about an end to formal apartheid, it was also a watershed in terms of the recognition of the key human rights like gender equality, which were and are paramount in building a united citizenry and nation. If we were to build an empowered, fair, and inclusive citizenry and establish one national identity through social justice and fairness and equity in terms of access to and participation in the political, socio-economic, and cultural aspects of our society, these values are an absolute necessity. Around the globe, gender equality has made huge strides over the last few decades. This includes South Africa. However, we still suffer from some very strong and outdated attitudes towards differences in genders and the rights of men and women. Levels of gender-based violence are still unacceptable, unacceptably high in South Africa. The statistics speak for themselves. And what is needed is a program of prevention that drives awareness and education together with the mobilization and participation of civil society to address this challenge and to change behavior drastically. Inequalities in terms of employment, education, and opportunity are experienced every day by many citizens across our country. Action needs to be taken, and action needs to be constant, and it should be understood that gender equality will not be achieved by a one-size-fits-all 
solution. We have to actively and substantially transform the daily lives of South African women. Ultimately, it is about having the same rights and access to economic freedom as men equally. Madiba said it best. The cause of women's emancipation is part of our national struggle against outdated practices and prejudices. It is a struggle that demands equal effort from both men and women alike. And that is the challenge we face and we are looking forward to exploring various aspects of this challenge with our panelists this morning. I invite you to enjoy this event and that promises to give us a lot to take away from to change the qualities of our lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Professor Ndebele, for so eloquently setting the scene for us and some of the issues that we're going to tease out and explore with my panelists. And of course, we welcome your input as well, because this is a joint conversation. It's a conversation amongst South Africans. Professor Ndebele said it's about listening and hearing and speaking. And let's hopefully get some ideas out of this particular discussion as to how we take our country forward when it comes to building social cohesion, but with particular reference to the issue of gender equality in our country. Let me introduce my panelists this afternoon. You've already heard a little bit about them. Of course, they're fully displayed here in front of you in all their glory. Uh, to my immediate right is Dr. Mo Ibrahim. He's the chairperson of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, of course, a philanthropist and entrepreneur as well. As I said, he delivered the 11th uh, Nelson Mandela Lecture uh, yesterday. And the work of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, as you know, has focused on Africa's empowerment with a particular focus on leadership and good governance on the continent. So a warm welcome to Dr. Mo Ibrahim. A round of applause for him. <laughs> Seated next to him is uh, Farrell Hafiji. She is the editor-in-chief of uh, the City Press newspaper, of course now the most widely cited, most widely sourced newspaper and uh, one of the biggest Sunday reads in the country and Farrell Hafiji taking up that role a few years ago after having prior to that been uh, the first female editor-in-chief of the Mail and Guardian newspaper. A warm welcome to Farrell Hafiji. Next to her, we have Aisha Mohammed. She is the station manager of the radio station called 5FM. Um, of course, with a wide appeal in South Africa, particularly amongst the younger audiences. And she's the first a woman to hold that particular position at 5FM. So a very warm welcome to Aisha here as well. Our fourth panelist is uh, Kave Bolambo. She is the founder and head of Women Across Borders, uh, an organization which has been doing phenomenal work throughout the continent in terms of supporting women. She, in her own right, her own history is a very interesting and colorful one that should you have the time, you should speak to her about having been a refugee in, in many parts of the continent, but she has built her life up and is doing phenomenal things for women across the continent and has been internationally recognized for her work as well. A warm welcome to Kabe Bulamba. Just to tell you a bit about how we're going to build our conversation, we're going to allow our speakers to give about five minutes or so of their thoughts as far as re it relates to their particular work and areas when it comes to gender equality and how we should be working to, as, a, as a key element in order to have social cohesion. So first up, I'm going to call Dr. Mo Ibrahim, but I I'm going to pick up Dr. Ibrahim about something you said yesterday about women being the pillar of uh, Africa's economy. But to what extent and how are we going to make that meaningful and to be seen amongst all African women? Your opening. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, as I said yesterday, we, 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 agriculture really is, is, is the main activity in Africa. 70% uh, of African people living on the land and off the land. And uh, agriculture is an activity carried out by women, it's not by men. So women do 
the main economic activity in Africa. Then they do family, then they do kids, then they do schools, then they do then they do other things as well. And uh, sometimes you wonder what actually men do. And uh, they dance very well. <laughs> sometimes they rape women. And uh, really, I mean, the, the disparity between the women and uh, men's situation in Africa is really amazing. Uh, now, we have a lot of things holding us. A lot of it, to be honest, are also cultural. And I love our roots. I'm a Nubian. Nubian is one of the oldest races in Africa, one of the first people to build pyramids in the world, before the Egyptians, actually. And I'm very proud of that. But it doesn't mean that I don't look back at my culture, at my tribal uh, uh, roots critically. Not everything Nubian is right. Not every, and that's what people also need to address. Not everything Zulu is fantastic. Not everything, this it doesn't we don't mix our pride in being African and our pride in our roots with adopting all what is terrible and bad in our uh, practices. We need to purge it. And that is the way to maintain this identity looking forward, otherwise it will not survive. This is an intelligent way to maintain really uh, our culture. And we need to have the courage to do that. Because I believe a lot of our problems come from really this cultural inheritance, which put men above women. And I think also, there is an economic reason for that. We come from a history where a man was a provider and a woman was the kept uh, and, and fed to reproduce, etc. And that has changed. Actually, women become uh, really very much involved, if not the main producer. And I was talking with two distinguished South African academic, academics here last, last night uh, just to confirm what we see from, from elsewhere. Women now are much more academically successful than men. And uh, in our foundation, for example, we offer a number of fellowships and scholarships and stuff like that. And the most prestigious fellowships we have, which is one year internship with, uh, uh, work with Pascal Lamy office in the uh, World Trade Organization, to be mentored by the president, to be mentored by Kabruka, the president of the African Development Bank, the head of UNECA, etc. $100,000 a year for really successful people. And for three years, we have three, so we have nine winners, and all of them are women. When we perceived and we started that fellowship, we thought of saying a condition here, it had minimum women should be at least 30 or 40 percent uh, of, of, you know, of, of the candidates. And some people on the board said, oh, well, is that necessary? Let us see. Now we're thinking to say men should be at least 30 percent of the candidates because those guys did not win one. one. We received 3,000 applications, 4,000 applications. I talked with the with, 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 with prof yesterday, you know, vice chancellor of Cape Town University, and now we, with, with the vice chancellor of, of the uh, uh, University of South Africa here. And I asked them, what is the situation here? And they said, oh, women. The best academics we have are women. The best performance in all schools are women. I think that in itself is going to change the landscape. When tomorrow, most of the professional successful people are going to be women, not men. It's very interesting to watch the role reserve. When you guys become the providers, uh, what, how that will affect the relationship? Are you going to marry five men or six, <laughs> you know, men like our men do now? Or what? I, I don't know. But I really look forward for that new world which only you can define. I stop here to... <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs>
a fantastic input from Dr. Im uh, Ibrahim, raising many, many issues in there, uh, Vera, which hopefully you'll try and speak to, particularly some of, uh, some of the issues you raise about cultural practices holding us back. And I'd also like you to speak to the issue of the quotas that we have. South Africa is being praised for having a good representation of women, particularly in leadership positions in parliament and in government, yet in the corporate sector that we're still lacking. Mm. If you could speak to some of that. Thanks. Sure. Vera Hefshti. Um, so I, thank I, I, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's her turn. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It's man again. It's oh, man <laughs> again. <laughs> Um, so, so good morning, and may I first say absolutely no protocol observed, because I think one of the things that impacts on our social cohesion is the way that we've built these false divisions between us into VIPs, VVIPs, VVVIPs, I found out now. And in fact, all we are is, <laughs> thank you, um, are South African men and women trying to build a better society. Um, so thank you for that freedom of speech, MMC. <laughs> um, one of the things I really loved that Mr. Ibrahim said yesterday in his lecture was the generational shift. He noticed that President Obama was 47 years old when he became president, um, that Bill Clinton had been 46 when he became president. Um, and I think that really needs to happen here. So in addition to quotas, we need this generational shift desperately if we're going to make our continent jump ahead and succeed. So I'm a journalist. There's going to be some pictures up, I think, but maybe not. Um, so my job is to put my nose in other people's business. Sometimes this can get us into some trouble, like when you cover um, a spending of over 200 million rand on a presidential estate, um, you, when you uncover truth that people would rather you didn't know. But being a journalist also means being a partner of democracy, and of the potential and of writing about good people, like people who've kept up a vigil of love over our most precious cargo, and I think we all owe Miss Michelle a great debt of gratitude for that. So for young people, I really wanted to speak this morning about your worlds and about your personal worlds and how you can use that to build social cohesion um, and, to, uh, and, and to make our country a better place. So I guess everyone here is on Twitter, yeah, Facebook, maybe WhatsApp, <laughs> I guess so, okay, good. So I think that Twitter has done an amazing thing. It's made our world that much smaller and it's made the ability for solidarity that much higher. So how did I know about Anine Boyson, the young woman who was raped, she was about 18 years old. She was raped and murdered earlier this year. For the first time ever, we sat up and we take, took notice about it. I first heard about it on Twitter. How do I know in the past week about the harassment of the women in Egypt um, by the men of the Muslim Brotherhood? It's because I know about it through Twitter and Facebook. So those are the goods of technology. They can make our worlds that much smaller and they can make us act in unity with each other so much. But what are the bads? It brings us into an era of trolls, and it also is the era of selfies. Who of you have ever taken a picture of yourself with your cell phone? No admissions about that. I guess it does show that it's, it's, we're very much the me, me, me generation. And that's very hard when we're trying to build social cohesion and we're trying to build unity and we're trying to build solidarity. So I think sometimes hold that mirror outward and see what it says then. So one day, some 20 years from now, you are all, you young women, you're going to be statespeople, hopefully you're going to be philanthropists giving away a lot of your money, you're going to be future presidents, etc. I thought I might just very quickly take you through what your Facebook status updates would look like then. Eh? So what might it say? Will you have a happy, warm family? Um, but I hope that it won't all be about you. I hope that it will be about how you've impacted on other people. And then what about status, um, the status update? What will that look like? Will you have lived significant lives? And then what about our abilities to like? You know, we always say on Facebook, what is, what is it that you like or what is it that you don't like? I hope that you would have dealt a real death blow to inequality. 
I hope that you were the generation who will have ended um, sexual violence because I do think it's going to take the next generation um, to do that. And then when it comes to sharing, I hope that you're going to share more than just selfies, that we all will um, become part of the drive toward philanthropy, um, towards giving away at least 10 to 50% of what it is that, um, that we earn. So I thought I might just take you there into your world, but to very quickly answer your, your question, um, Nick, is I think that quotas have been, they have made South Africa one of the top places in the world for women empowerment, for women in power. But I think that the picture is very, the outcome of that is very, very mixed. Um, that we haven't been able to make a great, greater dent in our rape culture, I think speaks to some of the failures. That our corporate sector doesn't at all look like our public sector speaks to some of that failure. But I think it's obviously of great, great pride when you see women like, for example, Lindiwe Sisulu, like Pampela Rampela, who so clearly wants to be president of our country, like the Premier of the Western Cape, Helen Zilla, like the Public Service Minister, Lindiwe Sisulu, the Public Protector, Tuli Madonsela, really showing us how you can use your role with great effect and with great impact and with great power. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Actually, I think it's fitting that we should pick up with you when we talk about the youth and what they aspire to and what are going to be their key priorities, what are going to be the issues that they're going to push in for in the new South Africa. Yeah, thank you. I think, um, a lot of key issues and I think the issue of the selfies on, face, on social media versus um, like outwardly focused instead of inwardly focused is a big, big issue. And I think that that's very, very relevant. Um, for me, my personal view um, is that social cohesion is about the decisions we make in our daily lives. And this, in turn, has a knock-on effect throughout society. Um, so our response to the various challenges we face are largely defined by the level of so social cohesion in our country enjoys. I feel it's important that we understand social cohesion as something that we can practice or practice in our daily lives. Um, it's about the large and small decisions that we make every single day. As the head of a youth-orientated national radio station like 5FM, it becomes important for me to ask the relevant questions around social cohesion in terms of our audience and the youth of our country. As, are we respectful of their diversity? Are we affording them access to information, insight, and entertainment as they require? Are we treating them with the values that we wish to represent? Respect, empathy, integrity? And are we delivering well-informed content on a topic of discussion that represents all angles to ensure our audience is able to make their own informed decisions? Um, I think that what I'm trying to say there is that we are living in a world where um, we have social media and we have a lot of digital technology. Um, and we have a lot of um, information coming our way, but I think it's important for us to have the access so that we can make our own informed decisions as opposed to swallowing what it is that is of public interest. Um, do we engage with a view to encouraging and playing an active role in promoting awareness and fostering gender equality in the media? Do we promote, through appropriate institutions and organizations, awareness-raising campaigns and the exchange of good practice on combating gender stereotypes and the advancement of the realistic and non-discriminatory portrayal of women and men in the media. We accept that fair gender portrayal in the media should be a professional and ethical, ethical aspiration, similar to respect for accuracy, fairness, and honesty. The level of participation and influence of women in the media also has implications of media content. I think around the globe, gender equality has made huge strides over the last few decades. This includes South Africa and our democracy that promotes the equal of equality of all. We do, however, suffer from some very strong and outdated attitudes towards differences in genders and the rights of men and women. Culturally, the status quo remains relatively unchanged. And unless the mindset behind gender discriminatory practices is challenged, nothing much is going to change. Education plays a key role and is a major factor. Without good education, women will achieve very little. Even with women taking up prominent roles in society, outdated perceptions of male or female roles remain. Research has shown us that women's presence in leadership does not on its own result in gender equality in a country. 
I believe strongly that in the workplace, gender equality will not be achieved by a one-size-fits-all solution. The gender equity issues in the corporate world will be different from other social realms. Within the corporate world, corporate cultural willingness to accommodate gender equity will differ according to the sequa, sector, status, or positions of individuals. I think it's important, however, that we consider this idea for a moment. Does singling women out make them gender equal or make them gender separate? I still feel that true gender equality means everyone is treated equally. That means not singling women out for some kind of patronizing social treatment. The point of promoting gender e equality is to empower women and to give society reasons to respect women, not making men feel more bitterness by privileging them. There are enough talented women out there, so why single them out? It requires enormous management skills to have it all, but many women know and do it and do it well. With a good salary comes an extended range of choices and abilities to manage a corporate and private life as you can employ people to lighten the burden. Women without these financial resources have less flexibility, as well as less time to devote to their private wor or work life, depending on their profession. Nevertheless, it is an ideal choice and an individual choice that should be respected and supported by society. Whether you're a seasoned professional or a new recruit, as a woman, you will face a unique set of challenges during the course of your career. I leave you with six key pointers to establish your career if you are young and true to yourself. Number one, be true to yourself and in your dealings. Number two, be prepared to sacrifice what you need to reach your goals. Number three, don't ever give up learning. Number four, think of yourself as a brand and a project. Number five, find a partner who supports your personal development and be prepared to share their responsibilities with a family. Number six, don't lose confidence in yourself. You will make mistakes and things will go wrong Identify what went wrong, could have been done better, and be prepared to explain that to the next employer. In closing, we have to accept that there are no shortcuts to success. It's all about hard work, dedication, passion, and putting in the time and effort to get the results you want. My advice to aspiring women in media is to follow your dream, no matter the obstacles. Keep, keep the big picture in mind and never stop working towards it. This table with hard work and a drive to succeed will get you where you want to go. Thank you. Asha, thank you so much for that. Thank you for your input. Just a reminder from our broadcasters here that uh, cell phones to be kept off, please. They are distorting the sound that is being broadcast at the moment. Um, let's move on to our final panelist. Uh, Kave, of course, as we know, South Africa is, is a home for all Africans across borders. And you are going to speak to that in light of the work that you have, you have done. Uh, thank you very much. Um, when I was invited to this dialogue, I was really, really excited and I was like, oh my goodness. 11 years ago when I walked into South Africa, I never imagined that this could have happened to me. And the reason why I'm saying that is I walked into South Africa with nothing but my bags and my siblings. We walked into South Africa as refugees. So today is just one of those amazing days, you know, and um, while I was reading about social cohesion, I just thought to myself, we've been speaking about South Africa and you know the major disparities that you face yourself as citizens, and we're forgetting that we do have other people living in South Africa. What does social cohesion mean for a refugee woman like me? You know, what does women empowerment mean for a refugee woman sitting somewhere in you know in a township in the central city centre? And my response to that is starting women across borders is a response to creating social cohesion. When I thought about women across borders, I had a vision and I had a picture of women um, in different countries holding hands. I had no idea what social cohesion was then. <laughs> but now I can clearly say, see where it's going and uh, creating this platform where we can engage refugee women, immigrants, um, foreign national from very different countries together with South African women and come together and see what is it that we have in common. The major challenge that we face as women in South Africa is we tend to think that you know um, refugee women or immigrant women do not face the same challenges as us. But we do. We're all women. Your pain is my pain. 
you know, my mother's pain is your mother's pain. When the case of Eileen Boysin came up, um, I organized a one billion rising campaign was going around on the 14th of February. I was hurt by that and I said, you know what, I'm going to do this. We're going to go out and we're going to campaign. We're going to say, this is not right. It's not right to a South African girl being hurt like that. I wouldn't want it to happen to a Congolese young woman. And to me, this is social cohesion, sharing your pain, you know, and um, sometimes we might find it difficult. Even, I mean, the refugee community might find it difficult because of the xenophobia going around. Well, they don't want us here, you know, they're killing us. But that's not the point. Our differences is what is supposed to bring us together. The diversity that we share is what should be the bridge in bringing us together as a nation, as Africans, you know, as women and men, and build upon that. And um, the work of Women Across the Board has been amazing in doing that. I don't know if it's my personality in bringing people of different cultures and different backgrounds together, but we just seem to attract women of different social status, background, race, together in getting involved in the issues that we, we address as an organization. And to me, that is social cohesion. And talking on the issue of women empowerment, as a refugee girl, I just think women empowerment means sending a refugee girl to school. It means sending her to a university. It means giving her access to the opportunities that you know are available in the country. But uh, although there's limitation to that, we still have to fight for it if we can. <laughs> I'm trying to. <laughs> there are limitations in, in certain areas, but um, I'm sure there is, uh, there is a way where we can, can, we can come to a point and say, you know what, we can actually do this. We can include refugee women into our economy. We can include refugee women into the social sphere. But is that really happening? You know, so that's what I want you to think when you go out of here. You might have never thought about it, but just find out. Do you have refugee women in your community? What are you, have you ever engaged with them? You know, what is their life like? You know, that is social cohesion. There is just no way around it, you know. And uh, South Africa, you have one of the most amazing democracy. You have one of the most constitution. In the DRC, I've never voted. 11 years now, I'm still a refugee, and I'm originally from the eastern uh, region where there's war, civil war, so you can imagine um, the plight of women. And the, that, that area has been right now declared by the United Nations as the rape capital. If you can imagine what gender equality means there, it's non-existent. And I'm just one of the lucky women that are just, you know. Sorry. Um. And uh, when I started Women Across Borders, my hope was that one day I'll go back there, you know, and make a difference. But until that day, what am I doing with the refugee women that are here, you know? What, what will happen to them when they go back, you know? And uh, I just created that opportunity where they can be empowered, you know, and they can be socially included in South Africa, even though it's not to the maximum, but I think we will get there, and to me, this is the beginning of it. And the more we promote um, spaces where refugee women can be included, it's social great. Heather, thank you so thank much you. for that. Thank you, Kabe. And to all our panelists, that has been um, very fascinating and insightful. And you've taught us something new, all of us here today. And, and we thank you for those insights. Speaking of a rape culture in the, DR, uh, in the DRC, it being the rape capital, South Africa itself, as advanced economically as it is, and in so many other ways, also faces, as Farrell Hafiji said, what we are now calling a rape culture in the country. 
and I'd like for us to explore beyond merely naming it, are we dealing with it as a society um, and looking at the underlying issues as opposed to merely driving it from the latter end as in what is to be done? What has led to this in our societies and how are we going to fix it? I'll open it up to the floor. Yes, that table. And then ready yourself for your own questions. I'll be taking questions from the floor. Uh, uh, that's a difficult question you throw at me, but I suppose sitting at the beginning here probably, uh, uh, what led to this culture? Uh, I really don't know. Uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, oppression is something both men and women suffer of in this country under our time humiliation. And uh, which is a very humiliating experience actually. And for us Africans outside South, from outside South Africa, we cannot even comprehend it because we have not experienced that. We try to. And I imagine uh, somehow the oppression uh, uh, suffered by the African man found some kind of outlet by turning an into an aggression and oppression towards the women in his society. Whenever, you know, I know this terrible example, but I was told, you know, in these terrible countries where they have torturing as an institution, uh, you know how they train torturers? They torture them first. And they say people who are tortured make the best torturers. And uh, there is something probably there about men suffering and passing on their suffering uh, 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 to, to somebody else. Uh, that what I probably can think of. Uh, why, why, why in South Africa? Because women position in most of Africa is not fantastic. But I think South Africa stands out as uh, with a high percentage of crimes against women, assault, etc., it is very high. Gender really here is, is a major issue. Uh, than, we are not angels, we're, but, but we are be slightly better off than, than here. And I think this trauma may be uh, uh, affected uh, psychic of men. Cyril, I mean, you mentioned the example of Anine Boysen um, that made international headlines and headlines here at home. Is there a symptom where we merely focus on something while it's happening and then we tend to veer off our attention wanders off to the next big tragedy. Um, Nick, I've, I've tried to study this and I think that after apartheid we really want to just be a party nation realistically, let our head down and not really think about the ugliness in our society and its dangers. So on AIDS you saw us almost completely turning our face against the outcomes of that pandemic. And I see us doing exactly the same thing on rape, so we'll be shocked by Anin's rape. But really since then, on every week on page two of City Press, we carry a rape map. There have been incidents as bad, but they haven't caused the same outroar. So I, out, uproar. I think we get outraged annually, um, and we know all the things we should be doing. There's many people in the audience who can speak about that. But my view is we've, turned, we've chosen to turn our face away, and maybe it's this generation who's going to make us look hard at it. Huh? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think I agree with Ms. Ferriol there, definitely. I think that um, the focus almost needs to change in terms of what the priorities are. And um, a lot more insight. I mean, I think we've got a lot of insight, and there's been a lot of uh, programs and um, definitely a lot of work being done in terms of learning about uh, the issues, but I think that just maybe the focus is where the issues lie, you know, changing our focus. Yeah, one of the practical, um, one of the issues that came up when I held the rising around an invoicing was the women that came asked me, what can we do? We came, we rose, we're going back home to our normal lives, but what else can we do? And I struggled to answer that question, but I just told them, find the nearest shelter to you, find the nearest woman who's being affected next to you, and be supportive to that, or get involved in that. 
And whenever there's an opportunity to rise like this nationally, do that. Because we all can't go to Cape Town and, you know, and hug and embrace and mother. So being practical and being involved in what's happening around you, I think, is more important. Yeah. Okay, let's open it to the floor and get some questions from our guests here this morning. Any questions for our panelists um, who have kindly shared their insights here this morning? Uh, there are roving microphones, um, I believe, um, that will be doing the rides. So if you could please raise your hands by way of demonstrating that you have a comment to make or a question to raise with our panelists, please do so now. I can't see um, the rest of the room. So we have a question to our left-hand side there. Could someone please take a microphone to the left-hand side of the room? Um, I don't know if there is one there already. Is there? Or if you could come, come closer to the side, thanks. And we will just share our microphone, I think. Thank you. Come closer so we can all see you and hear you and hear you make your input. Thanks. Hi, good morning to you all. My name is Pasitana Malema and I'm particularly directing this to you, the young lady on the left. Um, you know, when we're referring to social cohesion, I want to just confirm that there is not something that you feel as a refugee. Some of us are South Africans, but we still feel that in house here. I have a young lady today, a white lady there. She's my, believe you me, she's my daughter-in-law. <laughs> okay, she has, a, she has a daughter who is my 14-year-old. She's now 17, my 14-year-old son there. But you cannot be with a child because of the social cohesion problem. You can't even see the child. She's been forced to adopt the child, to give the child up for adoption. So we're saying there are problems that we need to, you know, um, voice out and need help. And I'm glad to be invited to this forum today so that elderly can just advise us on how do we now make people understand that social cohesion is important. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we have a question on the side of the room. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kwanele Asante Shangwe. I'm a social activist. And uh, my heart goes out to you, Gale. Thank you for your bravery. And this is for Phil and Nick <laughs> <laughs> Um I liked what she said, Phil, about how we are a party nation. It is very hard in this country to have support for grassroots um, work that is sustainable and impactful. We seem to have very short, limited uh, time spans and Yes, the community can stand up, rise up, go for marches, but I can tell you a march does not make a difference tomorrow when the abused woman has to survive. The issue is around how do we as society start using the constitution to enforce the rights that are enshrined in there on behalf of people with social economic challenges. And how do we get government to start giving substantive solutions to the issue of violence against women? It is heartbreaking to forever be dealing with a woman who is chanted from pillar to post, especially after marches. How do we start these kind of dialogues to make sure that we have sustainable impact and that we really change the lives of South African women, especially as, uh, South African women, especially the 90% who live in poverty. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to give um, our panelists a chance to respond to those two issues before taking more questions. Here, not to remake things, but to use the wonderful examples before us. My inspiration at the moment are two organizations. One is called Equal Education, which I think did the essential grassroots work of finding out, lobbying, campaigning, and taking issues to court. The other is Section 27. So there's a whole new range of political activists who I think offer um, women against violence activists um, the full range of arsenal 
uh, to, to begin doing what the lady spoke about. Vera, my question is to you. You mentioned that um, you believe that the next generation has quite a vital role to play in terms of facing you know, challenges that we're facing with gender equality and so on and so forth. Um, but I find that our generation is most plagued with ignorance or lack of knowledge around these challenges. So I'd just like to ask, what is the role, like, what's the role that you see the generation playing in tackling these challenges? We'll take one more from the side and then we'll give our panelists a chance to respond. Do you have a microphone there? Do you? Good morning, everybody. My name is Cleo Masana. I was touched by Ms. Bolambo's input. I think when I came in here, well, the first thing I said to Farrell, I work for the Department of Home Affairs, I said one of the things um, we seem not to be getting right when we celebrate Women's Month, when we celebrate everything, we seem to forget about other nationalities. The focus is always about the South African women. We don't look at women refugees. And I think one of our biggest challenges is about engagement and not reaching out to each other and getting the proper networks within which we can discuss issues of common interest. And it's, as a department, we have acknowledged some of the weaknesses that we're having, but also we are trying to improve. But if we can be able to reach out to the correct platforms, because there's a combination of complexities that we're facing, Apart from having to acknowledge refugees, you also have to educate your citizens about when refugees are here or any foreigner who are here legally. And I would like to invite you, because our minister thought about this thing, we're having a, a, a breakfast in Cape Town on the 22nd of August to celebrate the achievements made by refugee women in South Africa. And also, we want people to give us input because in order to improve on service, you only improve by getting feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we're going to give one more question in this particular round to Mrs. Michelle. We have been here and we have been neglected and we are in millions. We are in millions in this country. It's not a neglectable number. So just for reminding us, I want to say thank you. The second thing is you are talking about women in the DRC. Again, for us to feel so ashamed. You know, those who have raised the issue on what you call a culture of rape, they have been all over. I mean, Americans, Europeans, everybody. We haven't heard a very strong voice of African women against that. Sometime back I tried through the African Union Human Rights Commission, which is chaired actually by a woman. I addressed them and they said, look, we have to take this issue of women in the DRC to the Security Council of African Union. And uh, to, just to cut the story short, just to tell you that it has been now almost two years and we have not been able to table the issue of women in the DRC in the Security Council of the African Union. We've been trying, but we haven't succeeded yet. So it's one of those things which make you feel so small when we are talking about, you know, the rights of women, especially some of us who have been labeled to be women's rights activists, etc., etc. How we have been failing many of us, and it makes your heart very, very heavy. But coming to South Africa, I wanted to add to the discussion here one thing which has been of great concern to me. In this uh, whole process of transformation of our country, society as such has become much more complex, but I don't think we have taken the time to look at it and to say, what does it mean 
in lives of women, for instance. Let me give an example. Recently, I read that there was a report by the um, Institute of uh, uh, Race Relations, which was saying that 40% of children in this country, uh, they do have fathers, but who are not living with them. So these children are living with mothers or grandmothers, but the fathers are alive. This, 40, the 70, this is 47 percent. The fathers are alive, but they are not say, sharing the same roof with their children. So this tells you that uh, the structure of family in this country has changed very, very deeply. Very, very deeply. And actually of the 47%, they say 51% are black. It's black people. So we are praising all the laws and the constitution, etc., etc. But if we don't look and say, what is society has been changing and what are the responsibility? I don't want to call it a burden that responsibilities which are on the shoulders of women because of this change. We continue to produce laws, etc., as if we have the traditional family in which you have a father and a mother and children together. We don't really take into account that the family structures has changed. This is one part of changing. But the other one is those of the women, I mean children, who are living with grandparents. The family, for them, it's completely different of the other family. Yet you have a parliament which is discussing issues in terms of the traditional, what we call traditional, customary law, customary law. And now they are discussing, for instance, which they call traditional courts. These traditional courts, I don't know whether women sit in those traditional courts. Because in this tradition and customary laws, women are treated as minors. They don't have a voice when decisions are being discussed and made. So in one sense, you have a constitution which protects women, which says all these kind of things. Society is changing completely. And even worse, you have a parliament which is to look at these issues of tradition in a very traditional way, which has nothing to do with modernity. It has nothing to do with a constitution which is based in equality for everyone. So this country is confronted with contradictions which we are not looking at. We are not even. So I wanted us to say, when we think of women, we have to think of the different generations of women. What we were told there about this child, you know how many hundreds of thousands of young ladies who are coming to Johannesburg, going to Cape Town, to go to Durban, to big cities on their own, who are trying to make a living, and some of them studying. Even in our universities, if you go to issue of gender violence, within our universities, more you are saying that we are having much more success. That's true. Numbers have, are changing, and that's very positive. But what is not changing is the human relations between men and women. What is not changing is the societal, you know, change is not taking. So I think we need to celebrate numbers which are changing. We need to celebrate, Ferial, you are right. I mean, there's a new generation of, of women today, and it is going to be interesting to see what is going to happen, I mean, in 20 years' time. But it, while we celebrate that, we have to look and say, what we have to do to change human, I'm saying human first human relation between men and women. And to, um, to put this in small pieces for us to understand. We can say just tradition and leave it there. I think it is much more deeper than that. We need to understand that and to build our young people 
in understanding and acceptance of the quality between a human being who happens to be female and another human being who happens to be a male. That is where I think, together with all these numbers which are changing, etc., etc., that's where the core issue is. Because, I'm sorry to be long, because we know even women who have, are highly educated, professionally very, very successful, they live in a beautiful relationship. So it's not only the issue of education, it's not only the issue of being independent financially or professionally. They are deep, deep, deep human relations which are not changing. And it's not in South Africa alone, it's all over the world. One of the biggest challenges today is gender violence wherever you go. So that is the issue which I want to raise for us to think. And now I'm going to turn to you, Prof. I think these, these debates have to continue. The, the, the foundation was doing this regu regularly, and then we said, well, no, it has to go to community dialogues. I think the Nelson Mandela Foundation has a responsibility to continue this kind of dialogues. And I want to look at my sister. And I'm sorry, Zanelli, I'm going to put you on spot, and I didn't consult with you before. But you started, as a first lady of this country, you started a movement which you call the Saweed, if I'm correct, which brought women, which was bringing women of all structures, the way rural and urban, the way educated, not educated, professional, not professional. It was really the face of South African women coming from all walks of life. And that is not happening anymore. You don't have to be, no? Well, at least I'm not aware of. So because you are the one, yeah, because you are the one who started, I just want to encourage you, Sissy, please carry on. You have to do that. We need that, that space. We need that space and very, very strong and loud. You know, we don't have any place where you talk about women's issues without being in politics. Actually, I have to say, those who are in politics, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say this. I mean, they do everything expected to debate issues of women. All of them, including the ANC. They're not doing this. So I think you need a space which is absolutely independent, a space in which all of us, we can feel a, we, we, we have a stake independently of the political colors, of social structure, whatever, where we can talk as women. And so I put here two people on spot. One is the sister Nelly, as I said. Second is Prof. has to continue. And now to you, Farrell. I want to sit down giving you another. You know, this country, like any other, we don't have what you call equal work, equal pay. We don't. And uh, you, as I said, they are very, very professional women who are very, very successful. But in, not always they get the same salary. Maybe the two of you, the, because you are in the media and you are very strong and you have been doing extremely well, help us to really go and see where is it where women, despite being educated, professionally competent and very good experience, they are not getting the same salary. So we also need to have that place here. Equal work, equal pay in South African society. Thank you. Okay, we have, uh, we'll take two more questions. Um, my name is Vanessa Perron. Well, I'm so emotionally charged um, so much has been said, your plight in Rwanda and people being raped. You know, and yesterday Dr. Uh, Dr. Mo Ibrahims put such a big statement out to the world's media. And he said the world looks to South Africa for leadership. And he congratulated South Africa and he said they're the most empowering country in the world to have females as leaders. So I don't know whether to be embarrassed or to be happy that in 20 years, in South Africa, we still, some of us wouldn't even know where the DRC or Rwanda is. Because the narrative that Ferial speaks of in social media and media 
is never told. We never use the media effectively in this country or across the continent to unite the 54 countries. We are our own worst enemies. We never tell our stories properly. We put us in a position that ensures that we are entrenched in slavery, not only from each other, but from Western and European countries itself. And so even as I myself have put myself in human rights activism to change the narrative of Africa, I think it's incumbent that we support each other so that we can talk about your rape and being the central rape uh, country in the world. We're so bogged down in corruption in our own country. We're so bogged down in following male leaders that we forget about the plight of the woman right next to us. As a mother of a boy child also, I demand leadership in both sides. How do we balance that? So I'm just asking media houses, that, I mean, I'm a journalist first before I'm a human rights activist. Let us work with intentionality to change the narrative of Africa. I think it's important that we offer solution-based dialogues, that we challenge our editors. I mean, every time there's a woman leader and there's no change, what, what does it help us to have another woman leader? You know, before we used to say behind every successful man, there's a woman. I'm scared to be part of the generation. Behind every corrupt deal, there's a woman who kept quiet. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the narratives I'd like to see. Uh, my name is Vanessa Peromal. I'm reading an Africans for Africa narrative. I'm a mother of two from Actonville, Benoni. I have a license with the Festival of the Desert. So people in Africa are so isolated. You need help, but we don't even look at you. And so I'm appealing to South African women, let us focus away from us only. Let us use the media channels and ways that can unite us. Okay. Vanessa, thank you so much for your input. We'll take one final question for this particular round, the young lady over here. We'll have a microphone here, please, right at the front here. The young lady seated has been waiting for quite a while. Let's give her a chance. Thank you. My name is Kimberly Malope. I'm a 11-year-old motivational speaker. I'm the founder of The Hand That Gives. I've taken it upon myself to travel from one province to another, educating young girls about the use of sanitary pads, hygiene, industry, and HIV and AIDS. Dr. Mo, it pained me yesterday when you said that only 2% of women are in agriculture. According to Start Engine Google, the Eight Millennium Goals, 2050. We as Africans are working hard towards a common goal, which is eradicating poverty, infrastructure, and so on. However, there are still kids in rural areas who go to school under trees and are suffering from hunger. My question to you is, how do you then define gender equality and social cohesion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. I think we're going to get a response to that and all of the other issues raised by Mrs. Michelle as well about the complex nature of what is happening in society and the lack of change. Uh, Afiro and I show a direct challenge to you to uh, lead the charge when it comes to equal work and equal pay. And I think beyond just Professor Ndebele and uh, Mrs. Mbeki, is the issue of where do, how do we have these discussions, where do we take them forward, and on a national scale, and how do we drive buy-in from everyone in participating and coming up with solutions as well. I'm gonna put that almost as a closing uh, for my panelists to give their responses collectively. I'm sorry we have run out of time. Dr. Abel. Uh, first, I think really, uh, I want to thank uh, our sister Grasa for the uh, wonderful uh, intervention and uh, first time I hear you for like two years now maybe last time I heard you you doing Gavi in London and Afri Africa misses you out actually uh, it's, it's a wonderful contribution uh, I just want to say maybe one one or two things yesterday I commended the African government because the uh, sorry South African government because you have a high women representation mm. in the cabinet and parliament and you know uh, status etc that's wonderful but that can also give a false picture of reality uh, you know don't forget 
we have a woman actually running Bangladesh. There is a very strong woman run, running India before that. Pakistan was also run by a woman. Coming. The position of women in these three countries, I think, is not really fantastic. So having some few women in the leadership up there doesn't mean really that things have changed in, 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 the, you know, in the country. And I'm very surprised. I mean, you talked about uh, equal pay. I, I didn't realize that that is a, situation, is a problem here in South Africa. You have the most wonderful constitution. You have all these women in parliament and all these women in, 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 in cabinet, what they are doing. If you don't enforce that, and that that's, uh, I think I'm, 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 I didn't realize that this uh, uh, situation uh, uh, is there, and I think you guys need to go and pick it the parliament, or uh, I mean that's out of question. How how can that happen? Okay. okay, Ms. Michelle, who can say no to you? So um, in a year's time. I think we commit that we'll get the work done, but then we have to hand it over um, to women in South Africa to take the Equal Pay for Equal Work campaign ahead. Um, as to, to, to the young person who said, so what can we do? I see many, many young people already doing wonderful things, not sitting back and waiting like the young lady over here. And if I can give you one answer, Many young people say to me, and I suppose that's our generation's fault, we're not interested in politics. I suppose that's because three million young South Africans who can't find jobs, political leadership's not really working for them. And I do think it's for them to take a page from the book of Tunisians, um, people, young people in Spain, in Greece, I would say Egypt, but that's not such a great example in, in this week. Um, so really, it's all out there for you, and it is up to you um, to do the work. But we do hear your cry. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Michelle, again, um, really appreciative of what you said. Um, I think we'll definitely make it a concerted effort. Um, myself and Perry will definitely start the, the work towards um, equal pay. Um, again, very touched by what you said about our constitution and the way in which um, we're following a constitution of rules and rights. Um, or ways in which we tackle a society that's not necessarily traditional. Um, I think we do that very much in the media landscape as well. We have an ideal um, to which we speak to and an ideal of what we think we, or what we think a family is. Um, so I'm very touched by what you said in that way and you've definitely made me think in terms of the way in which we're broadcasting every single day. So thank you. Um, um, I'm sorry to make you cry. <laughs> I didn't mean to. Um, I think what, what I have to say in closing is just, it's up to us individually to go and build South Africa to what we want it to be, what we really want it to be. It's up to each and every one of us sitting here and seeing young uh, people like this rising up really inspires me, you know, to see, you know, she has a passion, she has found it. And that's just, you know, that's her calling. And we all have a, a part to play in building South Africa and I think I'm playing mine right now, and yeah, thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and for your input here this morning. It's been really worthwhile, given us lots of food for thought, and it is builds the ground, the foundation for us to build on these conversations that we definitely need to continue having in South Africa, with, of course, a solution in mind. And with that, let's call on Silo Hatang, who's the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory, um, just to wrap up for us this morning. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Nikki. Uh, I, I think uh, I need to, I don't know if it was uh, a, a secret, but uh, Nikki is not feeling well, uh, but she did a good job and it tells you how strong women are. Uh, the fact that she's still standing up and she's not feeling well. Thank you very much for doing this. Um, I think I also need to declare another secret. It, I was not told if it was a secret, but uh, Mo Ibrahim was actually intimidated by you. Uh, he told Prof and I last night that, oh, I'm going to have to address 200 angry women. So I don't know how I'm going to handle that, but I'm going to try. So you did well again. Uh, I want to thank the panelists who are with you for, again, making such uh, uh, lovely inputs. And I'd, I'd like to take on 
Ferrell to say that I, I think we should respond to, to Mama Shell's call together. So we would like to then join that call and uh, we would like to join the course with you. So we can then give her feedback in about a year about the work that we've done jointly on this one. I think it, it, uh, every time I listen to more Ibrahim, I, I, I get new definitions of uh, social cohesion. And I want to just pick up on four pillars uh, of uh, for social cohesion. As I've been listening to him, uh, you must know I've spent so much time with him now that I, I think by the end of tonight, I'll be thinking more, more, more. Um, so inclusiveness, uh, diversity, values, and access. That those four pillars are the ones that make it possible for us to claim even just to claim that we have a socially cohesive society. And I think it's not enough that we just say the words, but that we must do more than just do that. And I think we, we, uh, there are a couple of things that I'd like us to note. Can we claim to be a socially cohesive society when we have women who are paid less than men for the same kind of job? And I'd say no. Um, can we claim that we have a socially cohesive society when the women cannot walk freely on the streets of, society, of South Africa, never mind in the DRC, um, that you fear walking freely with your dog uh, after a certain hour? Can we claim that without fearing that you'd be harmed, even raped sometimes? So can we claim that we are a socially cohesive society when refugees fear xenophobia? in our country. And when they are women, they have to even lose their identity. Just you lose who you are, that you can't even claim that you are from the DRC for fear of reprisal as a result. Can we claim that we are a socially cohesive society when girl children cannot complete school? Because they've been impregnated by an older man because of lack of resources. That they have to get money from this older man and they get impregnated. Can we claim that when at, at the end of the day, there's a culture uh, that a child cannot complete school because of some culture, cultural impediment that tells you that you can't complete uh, a school. At the end of the day, as Mo Ibrahim said, that social cohesion is about, at the heart of social cohesion is about ensuring that people have dignity. And I want to say what I said on Friday again, that uh, 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 Benjamin Pogrant in, in his book, uh, um, uh, in his book, How Can Men Die Better? Talking about the life and times of uh, Robert Sobuko. Says a man can forgive you for stealing his money. He can forgive you for stealing his wife from him. That's if he loved her enough. Um, but one thing that he won't forgive you is for taking his dignity away from you. And I think it's something that we should be empowering women with on a daily basis. At this point, I'd like to say that we are challenged uh, we've been challenged by this group here, and mom, we want to reassure you that dialogue has never died at the Nelson Mandela Foundation, and we'll continue to do it. We'll continue to do it, not as talk shop, but that we'll take action, inspire change, and make sure that we build a socially cohesive society through Mandela Day, through, 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 through dialogue. Let me finish off. You can see that I'm so obsessed with Mandela Day. Um, uh, well, that's how the prof said, that's the measures of me getting a bonus, so I have to always just go back there. Um, I want to thank the following people, the Freedom Trust, uh, the Freedom uh, Park Trust, the SABC for being a great partner, the city of uh, 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 Tswane, uh, ably led by Margaret, who was actually a staff member of the Nelson Mandela Foundation. Um, and then from the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory, I'd like to just uh, thank my team again, I think I stand proud here because of Daniel, um, Yase, David, Lutando, Lee, Z, and Molly. And to say that without you, it wouldn't have been possible for us to do what we've managed to do. So let us remember that we, it's time that we take action, inspire change, and make every day, on a daily basis, that we build a most socially cohesive society. Thank you, Celo. I believe lunch is served. Have a good afternoon. Take care.